Well, good afternoon. We, on behalf of the Administration on Community Living at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, I just wanted to welcome you all here today as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Olmstead decision. My name is Julie Hawker, and I am the Commissioner of the Administration on Disabilities here at ACL. And it is my pleasure to kick off our celebration today. 20 years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Olmstead versus LC that the unjustified segregation of people with disabilities is a form of unlawful discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act. The Olmstead decision fundamentally changed the way our country approaches disability rights and opened doors for millions of Americans to live the lives we want in our communities alongside people of all ages, with and without disabilities. And of course, it is one of the cornerstones of the work so many of us in this room do each day. Olmstead unlocked many doors, but it took hard work, collaboration, and perseverance by many people in this room and to truly knock open those doors. Today, we're going to celebrate all that we have achieved across the last two decades since Olmstead. And there's a lot to celebrate. We are also going to talk about some of the challenges that remain and the direction forward. We will hear from federal partners at HHS and at the Department of Justice about some of the work we are doing together. Our keynote speaker will share research that reinforces what we all know, community living is the best option for people with disabilities. Most importantly, the core principles of Olmstead will be brought to life for us by several people with disabilities who will share their experiences and the vision they have for the future. To get us started, I am thrilled to welcome our first speaker, my colleague at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Roger Severino. Roger currently serves as the director of the Office for Civil Rights at HHS. Prior to joining HHS, he served as director of the DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society in the Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity at the Heritage Foundation. Before that, he was a trial attorney in the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division, where he enforced the Fair Housing Act, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, Title II and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It has been such a pleasure to work with Roger. He is a staunch advocate for disability rights, and he has been a steadfast supporter for all of the work that we do at the Administration for Community Living to improve the opportunities for community living for all people with disabilities. Please welcome Roger Severino. Thank you very much, Julie. Julie, you are a force of nature. I love working with you. So I want to begin with a story about my childhood. When I was a kid growing up in Los Angeles, I went to a public elementary school and really didn't have very much interactions with persons with disabilities. The kids with disabilities were put on separate buses, shipped off to some other facility, I don't know where, and were not seen. There was never that connection. And this was not by chance. This was a decision to create this separation. And it has an effect on both the children with disabilities and without. And I was realizing that perhaps there was something going on here. Why was the government doing this? It created a sense of otherness. And part of it came from a misguided sense of paternalism, that it would be better for the kids on both sides of the equation. But also at root, there was something more invidious. Uh, implicit measuring of a kid's worth and of where resources should be dedicated. Things changed when I got to high school and I had to, the opportunity to interact with folks who were in my neighborhood because there was a group home for persons with disabilities. And just as I would walk through my neighborhood, so would they, enjoying the day just like me. That also was not by chance that that group home was there, that it was integrated. And it presented an opportunity to start breaking down barriers and even addressing some preconceived notions that this kid had. So that's some of the progress that I've seen in my life. 
And that's a bit of a microcosm of what the story has been in the United States. In the 1880s, Nellie Bly, our nation's first investigative journalist, posed as a person with a mental disability to get into what was then called insane asylums. And what she reported shocked the nation. The conditions were filthy. People were abandoned. They were mentally abused, restrained, physically abused. The nonstop screaming, she called it a house of horrors and reported to it to a nation who knew nothing about what was going on behind closed doors. But progress was still slow. In the 1920s, we had the infamous decision of Buck versus Bell, where our Supreme Court said that the government can force sterilization on persons with disabilities, specifically to limit their ability to have more people with disabilities. The sense of other and less than was part of our culture and unfortunately part of our laws. In the 50s and 60s, there was a movement to create large institutions for persons with disabilities. And this was dramatized in the book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and the movie, which also pricked America's conscience. People were being shunted away into large institutions. Their desires to be integrated in the community were ignored. Some would have very little chance of ever getting out. Again, stigma and separation. Things started to change in the 1970s. We had Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. We had IDEA. And finally, the government was saying we will not fund discrimination against persons with disabilities in health and human services and in education. And then we had a landmark of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, followed up with what we're celebrating here today, the anniversary in 1999 of the Olmstead Supreme Court decision. So what the Supreme Court took away, it helped to restore a generation and a half later. Olmstead stood for the important principle that every individual should have the right to live in the place they want to live and fully integrated in the communities they want to be integrated in. The default should not be isolation and restraint because of a person's disability, but equal treatment because it recognizes a fundamental common humanity or equal human dignity. And that's the principle of Olmstead. That's the principles of the laws we enforce, and that's what we fight for every day at the Office for Civil Rights and at HHS more broadly. It is my distinct pleasure, privilege, and honor to be part of a team that enforces Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, the ADA, and Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act to make sure that persons with disabilities are treated as fully equal under our laws. We have an initiative currently underway to make sure that life-saving care is not denied from any person with a disability based on stereotypes. We had a case a few months ago where a person sought to be put on a transplant waiting list for a new heart, medically indicated, needed the heart, however, was denied a position on that list because a doctor noted that he was on the autism spectrum. We intervened in that case, and thankfully the policy was reversed by the hospital. And we're dedicated to making sure that stereotypes do not infect the practice of medicine. That there is no implicit bias where, where judgments are made by doctors or professionals evaluating whether one life is worth more than another life because of a presence or absence of a disability. Those quality of life judgments can turn into discrimination and we're dedicated to making sure that it has no place in our healthcare system. So I'm encouraged to see all of you here to be partnering with ACL, with CMS, DOJ, with advocates in the disability rights community. Just as I've seen progress in my own life, and as we've seen progress in our government, there's much work to do, and this is just the beginning. But for the moment, we can look back with pride in 20 years of progress since the Olmstead decision that recognizes the common human dignity of all. And I'm gonna introduce our next speaker, which is our own Deputy Secretary of HHS, Eric Hargan. Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary Hargan was sworn into office in October 2017 and served as acting secretary before Secretary Alex Azar in January 2018. So he was the big cheese for several months at HHS. He served in various capacities from 2003 to 2007. Um, he was actually part of the New Freedom Initiative under the Bush administration, which also impacted the question of Olmstead 
during the Bush days. He's head of our regulatory policy office. He has a BA cum laude from Harvard University, go Crimson. Has a JD from Columbia University Law School. He, has a, he was senior editor of the Columbia Law Review. And in between his tours, he also taught at Loyola School of Law in Chicago. So please welcome Deputy Secretary Eric Hargan. Thank you, Roger, for that introduction. Uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us here and by live stream today. Uh, thank you all to everyone at HHS who has helped to make this today's gathering possible as we're celebrating an important event today. Uh, it's an honor for me to help celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision in Olmstead versus LC, uh, which caused a sea change in how our country thinks about supporting people with disabilities. Today, in part thanks to Olmstead, we recognize that community living should be the default expectation for all people, and we're working to make that vision a reality. As you well know, that wasn't always the case, and as Roger had pointed out. Uh, Olmsted wasn't the first step on the path to where we are today, but that case allowed us to take a significant leap forward and to celebrate the pace of change. The ruling acknowledged the existence of resource limitations, but it also said that states should take reasonable steps to provide community-based alternatives to institutions. The decision has significantly increased the availability and quality of services in the community for people with disabilities. Now, I'm the uh, chief operating officer of the department, also the head of the budget, so you, oh, I can see what a dramatic shift this is from looking at the trajectories on HHS's program spending. 1999, Medicaid spent nearly three times more on long-term services and supports provided in institutions like nursing homes than it did on services in the community. By 2013, a majority of that funding was going towards services and supports in the community. So a dramatic shift uh, in a relatively short period of time, especially for such a large institution like HHS. To see a change in that is really a sea change in how the department deals with funding services. Um, Olmsted also helped spark innovation and research. This morning, I visited Gallaudet University to learn about the Rehabilitation Engineering Research Center, or RERC, for improving the accessibility, usability, and performance of technology for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. This RERC is funded by the Research Institute within HHS's Administration for Community Living, which is the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research, or NIDLR if you don't want to use that giant mouthful of, uh, 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 mouthful of words. Uh, through advanced research and development work, the RERC at Gallaudet provides people who are deaf or hard of hearing with the knowledge and tools to take control of their communication and hearing technologies, adapt those technologies to their needs in real world environments, and achieve greater autonomy and satisfaction in their use of technology. It's actually quite, it can be quite dramatic. I saw a couple of like interesting uh, demonstrations this morning at Gallaudet about the new research that they've done, uh, partially in re using HHS money, uh, but it's just intriguing to see a mission of a place like this that is focused not only on providing the services now and providing teaching. In fact, they, a good friend of mine is actually an alum of uh, Gallaudet, but also the future technology. Uh, it's actually, it was actually very, it was a very interesting time visiting there. Uh, this kind of work happens at universities across the country, and it happens in part because Olmsted created those expectations. Before Olmsted, those born with significant disabilities sometimes had no choice but to grow up in an institution. But because of Olmsted and legislating supporting the rights of people with disabilities, children with disabilities increasingly have the opportunity to attend school alongside peers with and without disabilities. As those children become young adults, they have many of the same decisions to make as their peers without disabilities, whether to go to college and important related questions like whether it's acceptable to come home from college to make your mom do your laundry, uh, how often you're really supposed to talk to your parents, uh, et cetera, uh, where to live, what kind of career to pursue. These benefits extend throughout a person's life. Before Olmsted, adults who needed help with many physical tasks had few options. They could continue living with their family or they could live in an institution. 
Olmsted has greatly increased the availability of these kinds of services and supports in the community, thus increasing the opportunities for people with disabilities to live independently. Around the country, states and communities are adopting an employment first philosophy, which starts with the belief that people of all abilities should have the opportunity to work in integrated workplaces. Individuals, families, nonprofits, and states are stepping up and working together to provide the supports necessary to make this work and to change the assumptions that people make about the capabilities of people with disabilities. I also saw this work go on at HHS under President George W. Bush when we led the New Freedom Initiative to lay out a blueprint for more community integration. Olmsted helped create the environment for that kind of change. Remember when I was there before, it was a new decision, right? I've, I've been around a long time now, you can tell. Uh, but uh, it was a relatively new decision at that time. So uh, putting together the New Freedom Initiative and trying to articulate within the department how to bring some of those principles into reality was a big challenge then. Olmsted has changed the world for older adults as well, providing some help with getting dressed or assistance with household tasks or developing new assistive technologies is often crucial to allow older adults to continue living in their own homes. What all these changes have in common is that they put people with disabilities as well as older adults in control of their own lives with help from their family if they need it. Now despite the great progress of the last two decades, and it has been great, we still have a lot of work to do to make Olmsted's vision of options and integration a reality for all Americans. Far too many people who could be and who want to be living independently in the community face barriers that lead to them living in institutions. That's why we are committed to making home and community-based services more easily available, to improving access to health care, and to improving quality and coordination of these services. In fact, I think my first trip as acting secretary was uh, with dealing with home and community-based services with ACL. I think that was my very first visit uh, uh, outside the department. Uh, this is a piece of broader work going on across HHS. We've now all recognized that it's foolish to pay for patients to stay in the hospital, but not to pay for the preventive care that would keep them out of the hospital in the first place. Uh, we want to allow people to stay in their homes, to stay in their communities, and out of institutional settings. Uh, it's, the, it's the best thing for everyone. It's best for, the, best for everyone in the community. The caregivers, the people themselves, the government, the payers, everyone benefits from this altogether. This change in mindset has also been a part of the shift towards value-based health care, one of Secretary Azar's top priorities, where we look at the continuum of care, everything from prevention to treatment and other services. But as you know, we need to think even more broadly. The continuum needs to include more than just care. We need to think more in terms of a continuum of support and care. This means incorporating a greater amount of coordination between the health and the human services sides of HHS. As I like to say, the most important word in our department's name is and. Uh, it's health and human services. The integration between these two sides of the house within HHS, we are working on it. It proceeds by fits and starts. It's a definite part of this administration's drive is to, is to put these things across the line. We're actively working across the department to accomplish this. All Americans, including those who are older or who have a disability, are best off when they can live their lives integrated and included in their communities alongside people of all ages with and without disabilities. And our communities and our country are stronger when we harness everyone's talents and everyone's contributions. We've made a lot of progress on this goal in the last 20 years in America since the Olmsted decision. And it's my hope and our hope that over the next 20 years we'll see even more progress. So thanks to all of you for all the work you've done to make that progress possible. Thank you for your ongoing commitment to this important cause. And last, thank you for having me here, hosting me to join in the celebration and to recognize all of your work here today. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Secretary Hargan. It is always an honor to have you join our events. Thank you so much. Next, I want to introduce everyone to our keynote speaker.
Dr. Amy Hewitt will share what research tells us about the benefits of community living. Dr. Hewitt has extensive experience in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities. For more than 30 years, she has worked to improve community inclusion and quality of life for children and adults with disabilities and their families. As the director of the Institute on Community Integration at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Hewitt directs several federal and state research, evaluation, and demonstration projects focused on community-based long-term services and support for children and adults with IDDD. Her current projects focus on community living, autism, outcome measurement, direct support workforce development, person-centeredness, and positive behavior support. Dr. Hewitt has authored and co-authored numerous journal articles, curricula, technical reports, and books. She serves on the editorial board of the journal Inclusion and is an associate editor of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. She is a past president of the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities and currently serves as the vice president of the board of directors for the Association of University Centers on Disabilities. Please welcome Dr. Amy Hewitt. Thank you, Julie. Good afternoon. Thanks everyone for uh, inviting me here this afternoon and a special thanks to ACL and DHHS for recognizing the importance of the Olmstead decision and its effect on long-term services and supports for people with disabilities uh, in the United States. While I didn't know Lois Curtis or Elaine Wilson and I wasn't involved at all in, in the case, I do remember exactly where I was standing when the Olmstead decision came down because I knew how important it was and the difference it would make uh, in our future. The Olmstead decision, as you've heard, was the result of a case brought forward by Lois and Elaine based on discrimination and under the protections of the Americans with Disabilities Act because they were unjustifiably segregated in an institution. These two women wanted the right to be freed and have the opportunity to live in their community. I think often of Elaine and Lois and their families, and I wonder if they could ever imagine what a significant and long-term and lasting effect that their brave and unwavering advocacy and fight for freedom and choice would have on so many people. This decision and the legal precedent that it set led to new opportunities for people with disabilities, including people with complex needs, to live and be participating members of their communities in their neighborhoods, workplaces, and educational institutions. Over the past 20 years, the right to be participating members of community has fundamentally changed the types of services provided to people and the outcomes that we expect. Certainly additional cases that have come since oh, the Olmstead and have come since Olmstead, the enforcement of the Americans with Disabilities Act and actions of the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice have led to several Olmstead settlements that target a wide variety of populations and a variety of systems and communities. We have a lot to celebrate and I appreciate the administration on community living for recognizing the need to pause, to reflect, and to celebrate the importance this legal decision has had on many people's lives. Lois Curtis and Elaine Wilson stood up for their rights. They knew what they wanted. They knew what they did not want, and they spoke up. They used their power. The courts listened, and they made history. As a result, they raised expectations of our systems and of our communities, and many more people with disabilities and their families are speaking up and advocating for themselves. Since the time of the Olmstead decision, we've really changed how we think about community living and what participation in the community means to people. 
Even when the Olmstead decision was decided, community living was somewhat defined as simply not living in an institution or in a nursing home. We were focused on where a person lived and how many people they lived with. Over the past 20 years, we've been involved, we've evolved really how we think about community living and what it means to be living in the community. It's no longer enough to be living in the community. It's a matter of being of the community. And being of the community means a lot of things. It means having the right to practice the faith of your choice. It means simple things like being able to choose where you live and with whom you live. It means working for a real wage in a real job. It means being able to learn new things the rest of your life and to do the things that you really like and enjoy doing. All of these are new ways of thinking about life in the community for people with disabilities. There are also a number of key aspects or key components of living in the community and these are things like engagement, reciprocity, lifelong learning, I'm struggling here just a little bit with this computer. I apologize. It's catching me a little bit off guard. I'm a Mac user, and every time I get um, put in front of a PC, I really struggle. So I'm, I'm going to go back to my, my written notes so that I can um, feel a little bit more comfortable with the setup. So engagement, valued social roles, expectations, connectedness, self-direction, all of these things are... Uh, components of community living and participation that we expect in our communities um, now. Olmstead really made uh, Olmstead and the many state level plans that were developed uh, throughout the country brought about important systems collaboration. Uh, where advocates and people with disabilities and families, researchers, providers, and state systems are all working together to improve community supports, um, and as well as sustained longitudinal data that is helping us to stay on the pulse of how well we're doing um, with regard to meeting the intent of Olmstead and um, the decision that was made. Also, continued Department of Justice enforcement um, has been incredibly important to realizing uh, the intent of the Olmstead decision. One of the things that Olmstead has done is develop new public policies that are designed uh, to align with the intent of Olmstead by providing direction uh, and in some cases incentives to states to shift towards community living and participation. You probably recognize some of these, money follows a person, home and community-based services, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunities Act, and there are a number of proposed pieces of legislation too that will further uh, the intent of Olmstead and further community living, such as the Disability Integration Act, the Transformation to Competitive Employment Act, and the access, access to free speech. I often say that systems change takes decades, so we're at uh, Olmstead two, two decades, and we've seen a lot of, of change already. If you look at this trend line, it really shows the institutional population of people with intellectual and dis developmental disabilities, and if you look at it by decade, you can see the introduction of the Medicaid Intermediate Care program that started in 1967, followed in 1981 by Medicaid Home and Community-Based Services, and then the Americans with Disabilities Act and Olmstead. You can clearly see that since the time the Olmstead decision was made, uh, we have seen significant deinstitutionalization of people uh, with intellectual and dis developmental disabilities who were freed um, from institutional settings. Since 1960, in fact, 248 
institutions have already closed with another two projected to close in 2019. Of those 99 or 40% of them closed since the Olmstead decision was made. Institutional closures are certainly not the only data point to look at for us to celebrate. Since Olmstead, there's a clear trend towards the increase in people with disabilities living in their own home that they rent or that they own, and in smaller group homes in which fewer than six people live. Equally obvious is the trend away from group homes where seven or more people live. Important policies such as Money Follows the Person have resulted in 90,000 people with disabilities transitioning from congregate living situations to community living. That is something that we should really celebrate. That's a really effective policy. While not nearly as obvious or as quick, there have been some small trends in the increase in the number of employment for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities to have jobs in their community. It's a small uptick, but it's progress that we really should be celebrating, especially when you look at how these programs are funded and there are, are clear imbalances in where investments are made. We continue to make much more investment in segregated day kinds of programs than we do real work, um, and we're still making uh, some progress. Without question, since the Olmstead decision, we see state systems investing more in community supports. You heard that um, just a bit ago, and much less in community uh, programs. We're nearing in intellectual and developmental disability supports, we're nearing $70 billion in investment in community services, and that's substantial. When I think back to Lois and Elaine and wonder what their lives were like inside the institution they were living in, and then I read about their lives once they were freed from that institution, and then I think about what we know about outcomes for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities as well as other disabilities today, I know we've made progress. So let's look at a little bit of that progress. Today, over half of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities choose or have input into where they live. 40% have input into who they have as roommates. The overwhelming majority choose their schedule each day or have input into it, and they decide or have input into how they spend their money. I'm pretty certain that Lois and Elaine didn't have those outcomes. Since 2013, roughly 10%, uh, if you look across the years, of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities self-direct their services, meaning they make decisions about how the money's spent and what services they're gonna purchase. And if we look at people with physical disabilities and people who are receiving long-term services and supports due to aging, 70% can choose the service that they receive or modify it. 60 choose the type of, 65% they act, choose the actual type of service that they, they get. 40% choose their roommate and 95% determine when they get up and 80% choose uh, where they uh, eat meals, when they eat their meals. Additionally, 90% have transportation to get to medical appointments, and 70% have transportation to get to the places that they wanna go. Again, uh, I certainly expect that none of these outcomes were present for Lois and Elaine when they were living in an institution. So I think the data I just showed you gives you just a tiny glimpse of the progress that we've made since the Olmstead decision. Research consistently shows that people have better lives when they live and work in their communities. And while there's much to celebrate, we have a lot of opportunities ahead of us. We need to continue to make progress as we move forward in the next 20 years post Olmstead. Perhaps one of the greatest challenges that we face related to community living for people with disabilities is the disparity based on state. 
one of the most significant con contributions to the ability to achieve individual outcomes of community living and participation in the United States is that we have 50 states, the District of Columbia, and 369 counties. Time and time again in the studies that we've done at the Research and Training Center on Community Living, the single biggest predictor of outcomes for people with disabilities is the state in which they live. As you know, in the United States, it's very uncommon for us to have a law that says, here's the program, and you shall implement it in exactly the same way in every single state and community in the United States. Services vary tremendously across states, and that means outcomes for people with disabilities vary tremendous across, state, across states. Another area in which disparity uh, exists is in the area of racial, ethnic, and linguistic diversity and the context of community living and participation for our citizens in the United States. We know that there's an underutilization of home and community-based services by some groups, and we also know that there's a disproportionate use of more congregate care options by some groups. Making sure that state systems are ensuring that community living and participation is available to, known by, and most importantly used by people f across racial, ethnic, and linguistic uh, diverse communities is critical to ending disparities in community living for citizens in the United States. As I said before, deinstitutionalization is cer certainly something we should celebrate, but I would say we should celebrate it with some caution. We still have nearly 20,000 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities living in institutions or lingering in um, nursing homes. But what about people with disabilities who are still in nursing homes, are in hospital units, are in institutions for people with mental illness, are in child welfare treatment programs, and private institutions? Yes, we've made a lot of progress in the United States, but we've got a long way to go to truly realizing the intent of Olmstead. One of the things that I know for sure is that institution isn't about size. It's not about just the place. As much as anything, institutionalization is about attitude and what we've done in the United States is create a lot of little tiny mini institutions. Many of the smaller group homes that people live in are just as controlling of environments. People have just as much difficulty in it, making their own choices and choosing their own destiny in life. And we have to address that attitude until we can change the attitudes of the people who are running services and the people who are supporting individuals with disabilities will still have institutions. They may just not be big places. An area that we haven't explored enough at all is the reality that overwhelmingly the, most, the majority of children with the most significant disabilities are not experiencing inclusion in schools. Community living is about learning too and these children aren't being included. So it's an area of much opportunity as we move forward. As I said, certainly, states certainly vary in how they deliver services and in, as a major predictor of outcomes. If you look across states, there's variation in the percentage of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who have legal guardians. This number ranges from 5.5% in some states to 89% in others. In some states, it's almost an automatic process that when you turn 18, you be, have a legal guardian assigned to you. Yet we know people with disabilities, including intellectual and developmental disabilities, have rights and are perfectly capable of making most decisions in their lives. So supported decision making is certainly an area in which we have a lot of opportunity moving forward. If people aren't allowed to make their own decisions, if they don't have rights, 
they're not going to fully embrace um, participation in their communities. Perhaps the greatest challenge we face is the workforce and one that there's been virtually no policy broadly to address and very little state policy to address is the workforce of direct support professionals that choose careers in supporting people with disabilities. We've built our community system on the backs and out of the pocketbooks of these workers. And yet we know that they're the key to quality. This systemic flaw is that we've sustained turnover rates that approach 50%, vacancy rates near 20%, and wages on which no one can make a living, let alone support a family. These numbers have remained the same for the past 25 years, and to date we have no systemic approach in finding and implementing solutions. We know that these direct support workers are multidisciplinary professionals who are not recognized, not celebrated, and not valued by our systems of supports or our communities for what they do. Most people in our communities don't even know they exist and the profession is not recognized um, by our Bureau of Labor Statistics. In order to sustain the promises of Olmstead, we have to find solutions to the workforce challenges. Lastly, we also need to continue to improve our ability to measure progress through a person-centered lens developing effective measures and holding states accountable for measures that are specific to home and community-based service outcomes uh, identified in the National Quality Forum framework is an important step um, as we move forward in trying to improve quality of community living. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today and um, I hope you gear up and are ready for the challenges of the next 20 years post Olmstead. Thank you so much, Amy, um, and thank you for joining us all the way from Minnesota. We are so grateful to have you here in Washington. Our next speaker is Melissa Harris. Melissa has been with CMS since the summer of 1995 and is currently the Acting Deputy Director for the Disabled and Elderly Health Programs Group. Prior to this role, Melissa was a Senior Policy Advisor in DEHPG developing and implementing a number of policies to advance home and community-based services as an alternative to institutional placement. As the Director of the Division of Benefits and Coverage from 2012 to 2015, she was responsible for overseeing implementation of most Medicaid benefits, including benefits provided to individuals in the Medicaid expansion population, and the establishment of national benefit policy. Please help me welcome Melissa Harris. Thank you, and it is really such an honor for me uh, to be here today. Uh, I am from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the provision of Medicaid-funded home and community-based services and the cues that we took from the Olmstead decision. Uh, because Olmstead really set the stage for many federal entities, including Health and Human Services, to re-examine whether and how the dissemination of federal funds were advancing the aims of community living, optimal self-sufficiency, and socioeconomic advancement for people with disabilities. This paved the way for the release in 2014 of the final regulation on Medicaid-funded home and community-based services and the settings in which those services are to be provided. This regulation is designed uh, to achieve two aims. First, it's to ensure that individuals receiving long-term services and supports through home and community-based services have full access to the benefits of community living and the opportunity to receive services in the most integrated setting appropriate. 
you'll recognize that language from Olmstead. Uh, and second is to enhance the quality of the home and community-based services provided to HCBS recipients. It's important for me to acknowledge that Medicaid is an important resource for states uh, in satisfying their responsibilities under Olmstead, but compliance with federal Medicaid requirements will not necessarily wholly satisfy states' uh, Olmstead requirements. We take our cues from Title 19 in the Social Security Act. Sometimes that's a great fit for the tenants of Olmstead, and sometimes not. Uh, and so accordingly, we encourage states to regularly review their policies and operations to ensure that they are really facilitating persons with disabilities to be served in the most appropriate or the most integrated setting appropriate to their needs, irrespective of whether their services are being funded by Medicaid or from another public funding source. But that being said, the federal regulation on Medicaid-funded home and community-based services is a really strong opportunity for states to engage in the type of systems change to significantly increase the potential for individuals to be supported and receive services in the most integrated setting appropriate. There is a transition period associated with compliance with the, the tenets of the home and community-based settings provisions. Uh, it was initially running through March of 2019. It was extended until March of 2022. And this was in recognition that time would be necessary uh, for states, providers, beneficiaries, and other stakeholders to understand the actions that would be needed to ensure not only compliance with the regulatory criteria, but to further the systems change that would improve the overall quality and the provision of home and community-based services. The criteria for settings in which home and community-based services are to be provided include things like optimizing individual autonomy and making life choices, providing opportunities to seek competitive integrated employment, providing access to the greater community, ensuring control over personal resources, and ensuring the rights of dignity, respect, and freedom from coercion and restraint. In addition, settings have to assure that beneficiaries can receive services in their broader community to the same degree as individuals not receiving Medicaid-funded home and community-based services. There are some additional criteria for individuals receiving services in the location in which they live. These are called provider-owned and controlled uh, residences. And those uh, extra criteria are the ability to access food at any time, the ability to have visitors at any time, the ability to choose a roommate if a private room is not available, the ability to lock their doors, protection from eviction under tenancy laws or other laws of that jurisdiction. In some ways, those criteria are very basic, and they afford individuals receiving Medicaid-funded home and community-based services the ability to make decisions that many of us make on a daily basis and take for granted. And yet the implementation discussions that CMS has had with states and providers and beneficiaries and other stakeholders speak to the degree of changes that are necessary uh, to be able to adhere to these criteria, meaning that some individuals were previously not not receiving Medicaid-funded home and community-based services in settings that reflected these basic criterion. So for many of us, the provision of home and community-based services and the receipt of those services is a personal matter. We have family members, friends, loved ones uh, who need services and supports authorized under the umbrella of home and community-based services. And while the criteria in this Medicaid regulation represent a standardization that had been missing from the construct of service provision, the regulation also contains key flexibilities in how that criteria is to be implemented to individuals, and it all boils down to the concept of person-centered planning. I can't stress enough the importance of that concept. It is the backbone of the regulation and, more importantly, the linchpin to the provision of good services and supports. The provision of Medicaid home and community-based services is not a required entitlement to individuals who meet an institutional level of care. These are all optional services in the Medicaid program. 
And this can mean that there are waiting lists and a large demand for a relatively small pool of resources. And the criteria in the regulation helps to ensure integrity of how Medicaid home and community-based services funding are used. I do want to spend a moment talking about states. Uh, you heard from Amy a minute ago that one state is not like the other in terms of the services it offers, and that's very true in the Medicaid program. States have a fair amount of discretion in implementing Medicaid in general and in implementing the home and community-based settings rule. And it's important for stakeholders to understand how their state is approaching implementation of the various components of home and community-based services, including the scope of providers the state wants to continue offering home and community-based services. Uh, but we are seeing major progress since our work really uh, got going in 2014. We are constantly talking with states and providers and stakeholders, and we see progress being made in five key areas. Uh, the first is that states are taking major steps to invest in the capacity of providers to offer more integrated home and community-based services options, as well as, build, as building a competent, qualified, direct support workforce. Uh, second, states are focusing more attention on what they're paying for, how they are paying for it, and ultimately how to best assess the quality of the home and community-based services being provided. States are engaging with their providers uh, to become proactive in making organizational changes necessary to reflect the regulation's intent, to assure that individuals have full access to benefits of community living and the opportunity to receive services in the most appropriate setting. Or, I keep saying that. Services in the most integrated setting. That's kind of important. Uh, fourth, uh, we've seen a major push across states to redesign their approach to person-centered planning. Uh, and through the work that CMS is embarking on with our partners in the Administration for Community Living, we have launched the National Center for the Advancement of Person-Centered Practices and Systems. And that is to support states and HCBS systems across the country in improving their person-centered practices, processes, and policies. And finally, we have seen a number of states come up with some really innovative methods of engaging stakeholders in their implementation work of the regulation uh, with a particular emphasis on individuals with disabilities and their families. There needs to be great attention paid to implementing creative options for assuring that individuals with disabilities have a say in how states are operationalizing so many of these requirements and to make sure that their interests and, and concerns are at the forefront of policy implementation. So to wrap up, uh, the field of home and community-based services provision is involving in exciting ways. New provider models are coming onto the scene, including multi-income, multi-ability, multi-generational housing, customized employment opportunities in the general workforce, and control over one's resources, schedule, and lifestyle choices. Individuals who once only would have had an option of being institutionalized are now supported in living meaningful lives in their communities. CMS and our HHS partners, including the Administration for Community Living, are developing promising practices for ways that the regulation uh, can further advance state systems change efforts to improve the quality of home and community-based services, as well as ensuring that individuals again have full access to community living and the opportunity to receive services in the most integrated setting appropriate. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much, Melissa, and thank you for being here. We are always grateful for our partnership uh, across ACL and CMS, so thank you for joining us today. You have heard today from leaders across HHS um, and from our expert, and now we get to hear from individuals themselves who have been impacted by the Olmstead decision. We have seen, as people with disabilities, that Olmstead does not just represent a decision, but it is a promise. It is a commitment, not just a construct. It's a reality, 
not just a dream. And for many of us, our lives are not just better because of Olmstead. We are happier and healthier because of Olmstead. We are not just in houses and apartments instead of institutions. We are living and thriving in communities. And importantly today, we are going to hear from a panel of individual leaders in their communities, their offices, their state capitals, and right here in Washington. And I am so proud to call each of them my friends. They have been such an asset to me in my role as commissioner. And without further ado, I am going to give some nice quick introductions because I think that we are going to hear so many wonderful things from these three individuals. To my immediate left is Kayla McKeegan. McKeon, and Kayla is the manager of grassroots advocacy for the National Down Syndrome Society. She resides in Syracuse, New York. Kayla is the 2016 recipient of the National Down Syndrome Society Self-Advocate of the Year Award and a member of the National Down Syndrome Self-Advocacy Advisory Panel. She is best known for becoming the very first registered lobbyist with Down Syndrome. Welcome, Kayla. Thank you. Next is Liz Weintraub. Liz has a long history of leadership in self-advocacy and has, heard, has held countless board and leadership and advisory positions at the state and national level. She is a full-time time member of AUCD's policy team, and she is well known for her Tuesdays with Liz, Disability Policy for All where she attempts and is successful, I should say, at making policy accessible to all. Prior to coming to AUCD, Liz worked for the Council on Quality and Leadership. She's an alum of the LEND training program at the Center for Leadership in Disability at Georgia State University. She's received numerous awards, recognitions, and commendation. And today, one of her favorite things to do is to mentor other people with disabilities. And finally, to my far left, is Kimberly Tissot. Kimberly is the CEO of ABLE South Carolina, a center for independent living located in Columbia, South Carolina, a beautiful town. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I loved my visit down there. Under her leadership, she continues to push innovative, cutting-edge approaches to community living and disability rights programs. I got to see this firsthand. It's great. This year, Kimberly chaired the South Carolina Employment First Initiative Study Committee, and they gave a, they, she has given great traction across her state with this work. Kimberly mentors other centers for independent living across the nation and other nonprofit leaders right in her home state of South Carolina. She's been appointed by the governor to the statewide independent living council and currently chairs the state's advisory council on the education of students with disabilities. She is a true leader across the programs and across her state. And without further ado, I am going to turn this over to them with the very first question. And so, Kayla, we're going to put you on the hot seat first. Okay. All right. I so, turn this on. all right. So, Kayla, can you? And then we'll go right to Liz and right to Kimberly. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and specifically what has community living meant to you? And what does community living look like today in your life? What is community living? To me, it means making my own decision. Where do I want to live? One second. Now can everybody hear me? Perfect. What is community living? To me, it means making my own decision. Where do I want to live? How much is it going to cost me? Who do I want to live in? Live with? Being the adult. House maintenance. Budgeting. Shopping. Living on your own is never easy. And I know because I have friends. They live in an apartment together, and they support each other through ups and downs. But it's, think about it. It's now one-sided. It is always two-sided. And community living is about making your, your own choice. Your own choice. 
and having a support system at the same time. And community living works for me because I have a voice that allows me to be independent. Being independent lets me work on my life goals. So there's grocery shopping, going to the bank, being able to walk in and deposit money, or cashing a check. Finding recipes that allows me to maintain a healthy lifestyle and making a meal for my family. And independence is definitely a huge key to a successful life. Community living is so crucial in today's society. I want my message to be heard and not someone else's. This is why community living is so impactful to us today. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you, Kayla. And Liz? Thank you, Julie. I'm really excited and honored to be on this panel to help celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Homestead Decision which allow us to live in the real community. The reason why I said the real community is because when my parents sent me to a private institution, it was called the community. I will have to admit that when I first saw it, I thought it looked like a community because it had 10 or 12 little cottages where I live with one other person and a phone booth in the middle. There was a long driveway to get down to this community. Also, there was a long rectangle building in the front. I called it a, I called it a fake community. I don't know about you, but it's not the kind of community that I live in today. Today I have a wonderful life living in the real community with my husband. I would like to tell you a little bit about it. We live in a regular apartment building with other people without disability. And there are stores around that we can shop and enjoy everything that the community has to offer just like everyone else. I believe that we would not be able to live in the community independently, independently without some help from, our, from an agency. Someone comes in and helps us manage our money, or help me with my diabetes, or help me shop for my clothes. Our story isn't, like, isn't, isn't unlike a lot of our friends. If the Olmsted decision wasn't here, we would not be able to live in the community. Community is for all. I want to thank Lois and Elaine for their bravery fighting for community living. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. So community living for me is, is quite simple. It's about having freedom, and it's about having the supports in place so that we can live independently. Um, I have the privilege of serving as the executive director of an organization who, that is run and operated by people with disabilities. We understand, and, and what we don't, I don't think we get too much credit for, is we help implement Olmstead every single day by the programs that we implement the programs that we design, and by living it every single day with our staff and our board of directors. Um, we are proving every day how easy it is to be um, in the community and to live when there's supports in place. Um, and, um, and that is, I mean, in a nutshell, that's what um, community living means to me. Great. Thank you, ladies. All right. So much of what we've talked about today is how far we've come um, since the Olmstead decision and how far we've come in the last 20 years. I want to take a second, I want to look forward. 
I want to think about 20 years from now. We might have a little more gray hair. It might be a little, right? All right, so we're going to be a little bit older. Um, but in 20 years from now, if we come back and we fill this room with individuals again, and we bring back this great panel, and I'm going to start with Kimberly this time, and we'll go in the opposite order. How about that? Kimberly, what are we going to be celebrating? What are we going to have achieved 20 years from now? What are you hoping that this panel is focused on? I'm hoping that there will be no segregated programs. There will, people with disabilities will be heard in every single program. Um, and that disability rights are truly at the forefront of what we're doing. There's a lot of, there's a lot of um, programs right now that are existing um, that are, are going into that direction, but there's also new segregation starting. There's new institutions, even in our school settings, that are, that are popping up daily. And we've got to bring disability rights back um, at the forefront of every single thing we do. We also ha have to have people with disabilities at the table making these decisions. Um, I think that we have learned in the, in the past 20 years that sometimes when programs are designed without the input of individuals with disabilities, they fail. Um, and we've got to do something about that and change that today. Thank you, Kimberly. And I can certainly attest to the fact that I have seen that living and thriving in your organization down in Columbia, South Carolina. Liz, 20 years from now, what are you going to be talking about on Tuesdays with Liz and talking to us about at this event? I have to agree with Kimberly. 20 years from now, I want to see people with disability, all kinds of disability, as leaders in all jobs and careers. I want to see more people with disability in elected office. I want to see more people with disability leaving federal agencies like usually. I want to see more people with disability leading businesses. That's a great one. That's a great one. Awesome. Thank you, Liz. All right, Kayla, where are we going to be in 20 years? My hope is to be on a panel 20 years from now. I will not be on a panel because we have reached equality for those of us that are differently abled. If we have not reached equality, my hope is that we at least are on a higher level of expectations. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. All right. So I want to hit on a topic that I know is near and dear to everyone in this room and on this panel. And it's something I've talked to each of you about. And uh, Kimberly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you on this one again because I got to come down and spend time with, with your team and with all of your partners across the state and with the governor to talk about this employment. A lot of folks say it's one of the last frontiers to really push the envelope on. So, Kimberly, I want to ask you, I got to tour your Center for Independent Living and I got to come to your employment conference. But as we're looking out and we're looking towards the future from that last question, when it comes to employment, where is your center going and where do you believe that so much of our work in the disability space is going around employment to finally move that number of individuals who are employed in competitive and integrated settings? Absolutely, yeah. So it's all about changing perceptions. I think there is a, an, um, a perception out there that people with disabilities cannot work. They cannot um, work every day. They cannot um, work in the community. Um, and there's a protection against the disability community. And we've got to change that. And I, and I think the voices, again, of individuals with disabilities can, can bring that. But we also have to make sure that people with disabilities are working and getting an opportunity to be the model um, in our communities. I think we do have to close down sheltered workshops. Um, it is... <laughs> it is a... It is appalling that after 20 years of Olmstead, um, and we're approaching 30 years of, of the ADA, that uh, sheltered workshops are still existing. 
Um, that is not a choice. And a lot of people with disabilities who are, who are placed into these environments, they've, they've never had that choice to be in there. Um, and so I, I think that we've got to start with that. We've got to do some provider transformation, uh, helping uh, a system to who was providing services in segregated settings and, and assisting them with, with going into the community direction. Great, thank you. All right, Liz, I'm gonna come to you off of that because I know that you've had both experiences. You've worked not in competitive and integrated settings, and you have the great joy of being a part of the team at AUCD today. Can you tell us what's one significant difference for you and your life living in the community now that you're working in a fully competitive and integrated setting? I'm proud. I wake up in the morning and I'm proud to go to a job. And I'm and when I think about a job at my job at AECD, um I don't think of just a job, I think of it as a disability career. I'm in a career. I don't work I don't have a job at AECD. I I have a career, and yes, for the last 20 years, 30 years, whatever, we have been talking about jobs. And yes, Johnny and Jill can work in a job, and let's hope for a job at Safeway or, or Walmart or whatever. But, but we don't often talk about careers, and if people without disability can have why can't I have a prayer? That's a great question, and it's a perfect lead, Liz, into <clears throat> Kayla, who's just starting her yes. career in so many ways. So, Kayla, can you tell us, as you're looking ahead to your career and you're out doing advocacy and meeting and educating so many of us, including me, what's the number one thing that you help clear up, that you help make meaningful for the people that you get to speak to about people with disabilities having meaningful careers like Liz just talked about. First, thank you Liz for the segue. I really appreciate it. And I did start my career as a volunteer for the National Down Syndrome Society, going to meetings on Capitol Hill. I lobby for independent living with supports that are in, tailored to individual needs. Lobbying for laws that make the differently abled to work and not lose all benefits. Lobbying for career with equal wages and ending sub-minimum wage. My personal goals are individual living, having access to supports that are, that are needed to enable me to live on my own. My goal is to have that support system to help me learn the life skills that I need to be part of this community. And I will further educate and advocate for not just me, but for all individuals that are differently abled and to those with Down syndrome. Because all, like I said earlier, all voices need to be heard. And I will not stop here and now. I will continue the great fight and speak to many lawmakers, members of Congress. I want these issues to be faced forward and forward thinking. And like I said, I want keep, keep up with me because I am not done yet. <laughs> well, you, see, I, I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but um, uh, sometimes around 2, 2.30 in the afternoon, I, I get a little lull, but I've been quite awake for this panel. And I want to, I really want to thank you all, and I want to highlight a few things as we reflect back. And I think what is so important is, as we take everything that we heard from Roger in our Office on, uh, for Civil Rights, our Deputy Secretary talked about, Amy and Melissa have all talked about, is really the need to think comprehensively, to think across the lifespan. Mm -hmm. And to go back to the really fundamental idea, as Roger talked about earlier this afternoon, and the fundamental idea that each of us is given dignity and talents to share. And I think what's so incredible and what 
what voice each of you three um, young ladies bring to this voice is really your own path and your own experiences. And Liz, you know, what I loved about you is you highlighted um, what it makes to make it all happen, right? What it takes to run a life that um, you enjoy with a career that you're building and continue to challenge yourself in at AUCD. And Kayla, we see your energy we are going to be keeping an eye on you. Do not worry. Um, we, uh, you know I have your number. Oh, I know. And, <laughs> and Kimberly, we know that it's going to take leaders just like you in the trenches all across the nation, not just here in Washington, but in state capitals like Columbia and in communities really bringing the services and resources to bear for the future. And so I want to thank you all for joining us. I know uh, Kayla's had a busy travel schedule. We flew uh, Kimberly in last evening as well. And I want to thank you all for joining us and sharing um, your experiences and your knowledge and continuing to inform this conversation. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Julie. All right are going to um, give these ladies a second to kind of maneuver off the stage. And while I um, get the great opportunity to bring up our last two speakers this afternoon, and I think um, we have two great individuals for you to share, for them to share with you, I should say. Our very next speaker is Eric Dryband, who currently serves as the Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division at the U.S. Department of Justice. In earlier roles, he was a partner at a major international law firm. He also served as the General Counsel of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, where he directed the federal government's litigation of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He also issued the Regional Attorney's Manual, which established policies of EEOC's litigation program. Prior to his EEO service, he served as Deputy Administrator of the U.S. Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division. He directed the federal government's enforcement of the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Family and Medical Leave Act, and other laws. He received his law degree with honors from Northwestern University of Law, a Master of Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School, and his undergraduate degree from Princeton University. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a welcome to Mr. Eric Dryband. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction and uh, for the opportunity to participate in today's celebration. As you know, today we commemorate the 20th anniversary of the landmark Supreme Court case called Olmstead versus L.C., uh, the court in that case found that the Americans with Disabilities Act makes unlawful the unjustified institutionalization of people with disabilities. And I think it's important to say at the outset a very fundamental premise both of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Supreme Court's decision, and that is that disability rights are civil rights, and it is critically important that individuals with disabilities enjoy the privileges and freedoms available to all Americans. Congress... <laughs> Uh, Congress enacted the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, and just before he signed uh, the bill into law, President George H.W. Bush explained its importance. And this is what he said in part, quote, our success with this act proves that we are keeping faith with the spirit of our courageous forefathers who wrote the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And President Bush continued, these words have been our guide for more than two centuries as we've labored to form a more perfect union. But tragically, for too many Americans, the blessings of liberty have been limited or even denied. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 took a bold step towards righting that wrong, but the stark fact remained that people with disabilities were still victims of segregation and discrimination, and this was intolerable. Today's legislation brings us closer to that day when no Americans will ever again be deprived of their basic guarantee of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think, I think President Bush really summed up this, the purposes of the act well, and it's 
something that we continue to strive for at, at the U.S. Department of Justice and uh, at the Department of Health and Human Services and elsewhere throughout our country. In the Olmstead case, the court determined that the act's prohibition against discrimination uh, may require placement of persons with disabilities in community settings rather than institutions. The, the court determined, quote, that such action is in order when the state's treatment professionals have determined that community placement is appropriate, the transfer from institutional care to a less restrictive setting is not opposed uh, by the affected individual, and the placement can be reasonably accommodated, taking into account the resources available to the state and the needs of others with mental disabilities. At the Department of Justice, we continue to work to fulfill the promise of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Our Olmstead efforts incorporate issues that are critical to the full participation of people with disabilities in all aspects of community life, such as and including living in the community when appropriate and the right to competitive, integrated employment. The department currently enforces 11 statewide Olmstead settlements. Last month, we announced a comprehensive settlement with the state of West Virginia. In that case, West Virginia agreed to expand community-based services for children with serious emotional or behavioral disorders. Our investigation of West Virginia's children's mental health system showed that the state was sending many of its children to segregated residential care rather than allowing these children, when possible and appropriate, to remain in their communities and live with their families or foster families. During our investigation, we spoke with families who were unable to obtain community-based care for their children. For example, one 14-year-old and her mother could not find treatment in the community, so the child spent several months in a segregated facility in another state. She was four hours away from her family and had to sleep on an air mattress on the floor and take cold showers every day. Another family had a 10-year-old who had been institutionalized four times and yet was unable to obtain intensive community-based services to prevent additional hospital stays. <clears throat> Under our agreement, West Virginia will make available mental health services to children in their homes and communities in the intensity and for the duration of time that they need them. West Virginia will also expand mental health services across the state. The state is also working with the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services to leverage available Medicaid authorities to help pay for necessary and appropriate home and community-based services. The settlement will give all of the affected children the best chance to grow and thrive. And I commend the state of West Virginia for working with uh, us at the Department of Justice on that resolution. In another case, just over one year ago, the department also entered into a settlement with the state of Louisiana to resolve allegations that Louisiana unnecessarily relied on nursing facilities to treat adults with serious mental illness who were, who were appropriate for and did not oppose receiving community-based support. The state is working collaboratively with an independent expert and with the Department of Justice to implement reforms that will better screen and divert people with mental illness from unnecessary placement, uh, use person-centered planning to identify needed supports, improve transition planning from nursing facilities, and expand needed community-based services for people transitioned or diverted from nursing facilities. The expanded services include crisis services, intensive case management services, assertive community treatment, integrated day services, housing and tenancy supports, and quality monitoring for all community-based services. Now, we all know that work can provide so much more than a paycheck, a sense of purpose, dignity, independence, value, self-worth, and belonging. And the Department of Justice is working to ensure that people with disabilities have equal access to the tangible and intangible benefits of competitive, integrated employment. The Department's settlement agreements with the state of Rhode Island and the city of Providence offer individuals with disabilities opportunities to receive services designed to prepare them for competitive, competitive integrated employment. To date, 786 individuals have obtained employment over the course of these agreements. In Oregon, Another agreement has produced similar resorts. According to Oregon's data, over 5,000 persons have received new employment service, services and over 600 former sheltered workshop workers have newly obtained competitive integrated employment. When we cannot reach a, an agreed resolution, of course, uh, sometimes we can't, we try, but we can't at times, uh, but the Department of Justice does not shy away from using its litigation authority. 
we have tried two Olmstead matters in this past year. Last fall, we challenged Texas, uh, the state of Texas's alleged institutionalization of people with intellectual and development, developmental disabilities in nursing homes, where the institutionalization was unnecessary, at least as we allege. And we are in ongoing litigation, even as we speak today, uh, in Mississippi, where we allege that the state's failure to provide needed community-based services has resulted in the unnecessary segregation of adults with serious mental illnesses in state hospitals. That case is on, on trial right now. As President Bush reminded us when he signed the bill into law, the Americans with Disabilities Act seeks to extend the blessings of liberty uh, to all persons with disabilities in our nation. The Department of Justice will continue uh, our Americans with Disabilities Act enforcement to ensure that individuals with disabilities can lead uh, lives free from discrimination. I thank you again for inviting me here to share the department's work and the collaborative work of our colleagues at the Department of Health and Human Services in Olmstead and Americans with Disabilities Act enforcement. Together, our disability rights work uh, continues to address a vast array of barriers that individuals with disabilities face every day. We have worked hard as a nation to realize a future where people with disabilities can live and work as integrated members of their chosen communities. And we have made much progress, and of course, more work remains. We look forward to continuing to work alongside all of you in furthering these objectives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Assistant Attorney General. Finally, I get the distinct honor and privilege to introduce someone who most everyone in this room knows, Lance Robertson. Lance Robertson is the Assistant Secretary on Aging and the Administrator of the Administration for Community Living here at HHS. He was appointed to serve as Assistant Secretary on August 11, 2017. Lance's vision for ACL focuses on what we call the five pillars. These are key areas of focus that are critically important across both aging and disability and are areas in which we make a real difference for the people we serve. These pillars are supporting families and caregivers, protecting rights and abuse, and preventing abuse, connecting people to resources, strengthening the aging and disability networks, and expanding employment opportunities. As we've heard today, that last one is particularly important to people with disabilities. Lance's leadership in the field of aging and disability began in Oklahoma, where he served for 10 years as the Director of Aging Services within the state's Department of Human Services. Prior to that, he spent 12 years at Oklahoma State University. Finally got that one right. All of us at ACL are so very grateful for his leadership and for his support of all of our programs that are making a difference for people of all across our nation with disabilities. Please help me welcome Lance Robertson. All right, thank you, Julie. <clears throat> it's very kind of you, but I know you've looked at your watches and you recognize that we're 10 minutes over, so I'm gonna wrap us up quickly. I uh, really can't stress um, how valuable I have found this afternoon to be. I hope, likewise, you have taken good notes. I, I thought all of the speakers are just outstanding. While they had to be brief, I think they hit on some key points. Uh, it was great to have Roger and the partnership that ACL has with OCR and uh, certainly to have our Deputy Secretary here. That's, that's a, a wonderful nod of support for the work that we do at ACL to have um, HHS's Deputy Secretary uh, come over and say a few words. And then certainly um, as we dug in and, and uh, heard from uh, Amy, again, great job, Amy. I loved your overview, some of the data points, the call out for NCI and NCIED and workforce and all the different things you covered, all really uh, wonderful and timely points uh, to your message. And then, of course, Melissa, um, just the support that CMS continues to provide, CMCS particularly around home and community-based services. We're honored at ACL to work very closely, for those of you that may not be uh, aware, uh, with, um, with CMS more broadly and, and DEHPG specifically around how we can continue to support home and community-based services. 
What a great panel we had too, Julie. That was a great panel that you put together. So I really want to thank uh, the three, uh, Kayla, Liz, and Kimberly, um, all three of you. Thank you so much for coming and just sharing your own personal insights and opinions and really being the, the champion of this conversation. Thank you very much for the commitment of your time. And always great to have DOJ in the room, um, unless they're coming to serve you. Um, <laughs> So we, we are glad, though, for our partnership with DOJ, and I'm glad Eric was able to come by and say a few words. So uh, let me then ask all of you to give a round of applause to Julie, because uh, Julie, <clears throat> Julie uh, and her team put this event together, and we all know it takes a lot of work, but certainly worthy to do for such a great celebration. Uh, we also want to thank the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, for offering their facility for us to use. What a great uh, facility. Uh, so again, I think I'll just close by reinforcing what we've all heard today. It's a great message around the criticality of community supports, um, certainly celebrating the 20th anniversary of the Olmstead decision. Uh, as you certainly would know within the mission of ACL and then also by our name, uh, we are about community living and how we can make sure that uh, folks are offered um, every support needed. Uh, to live in the community in an inclusive and meaningful way that is person-centered. All of those things are the hallmark of what we do. Woven within every comment is the day-to-day -day work that we get to do and are honored to do at ACL. And, of course, we, as I look across the room, we're so thrilled to be working with just so many partners. And um, there are several different associations here that represent states. I know that Amy and others have called out the importance um, of really what states are enabled, equipped, empowered to do when it comes to decision making and supporting this conversation. So thanks to all of you that, again, every day champion uh, this conversation. So again, it's an honor to work with you. Thank you for taking uh, part of your Tuesday to be with us. And we wish you a wonderful rest of the week. And again, thanks for your time. <laughs>